Hi, welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'll be the administrator tonight. Uh, we have a really interesting session coming up with Robert Kravitz, who's the uh, superintendent of Englewood, New Jersey, the newly crowned superintendent of Englewood, New Jersey, may I add. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, parents as education partners. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about EdChat Interactive itself because we're really a, a different type of event from what you may have attended in the past. And also, I'd like to show a uh, one-minute video, uh, first of all, about EdChat Interactive. Uh, many of you I'm sh have taken uh, webinars before, I'm, I'm sure, where you sit and somebody lectures basically the same as I'm doing now. Uh, but what, what we decided to do, and this was Steve Anderson, Tom Whitby, and myself, is to see if we could make a more engaging online experience for people who wanted to learn things online. So we found this platform called Shindig that allows people to have breakout sessions and talk to each other individually during the course of an event. And we, and we worked out a forum so that different people can discuss different questions that we raised to make it a lot interactive than a typical webinar. So our goal is to have everybody leave the session today and be just as excited as a little girl up there on the, on, on the screen saying, wow, that was the best hour of PD I ever spent. And if you have comments or you, if you have ideas uh, for us, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you, can, uh, you can tweet us, I'm Weisberg M at, uh, on Twitter, or email us. Most of you have gotten emails from me, so you can just reply to the email and tell us what you think and, and, and give us some examples of how we can improve. Um, what I used to do is I used to go through slides to describe Shindig. They have come up with a uh, very short video to describe the platform. So I'm going to pull up that, uh, that video right now. So Welcome to Shindig, the video chat event provider. This video will guide you through our basic features. Click on any participant's image to engage in a private video chat. Double click on another participant to add them to your existing conversation. Click the arrow to exit. You can also send an instant message either to an individual or to your entire room. Want to interact with the host? Use the buttons on the lower right. Click raise hand to signal to the event administrator that you want to be brought on stage. Otherwise, submit a question to the host via text. If the system has not automatically detected your webcam and microphone, roll over your image and click settings. Click your image to enable your working webcam. Choose a working microphone by selecting the option with volume indicators that flash green in response to your voice. We hope this was helpful. Enjoy the event. So as it says, I hope that was helpful. Just a few things, again, if you move your cursor over your image, and I think your image is on your lower right-hand corner, you see there's something called IM. IM is something that allows you to send messages either to a particular person or to the, the group as a whole. And I think maybe during the course of the evening, Robert may ask you to put some ideas into the IM. That's, that's how you're, you'll go about doing it. And then you see that there's two buttons underneath. There's the raise my hand. Uh, as the administrator, I will see when you raise your hand. And I can, um, not up on the stage, I can talk to you or I can IM you. Or there's another button that says ask a question. If you ask, uh, then I will be able to see your question. And, and if it's a technical question, I can either handle it or I can have the people from Shindig work with you. Or if it's a specifically for Robert, uh, you can you can ask it, and I'll alert him that the that that there's a question out there. Um, I actually will not see the IMs that you put up there. So if you want something, uh, if you want to reach me, you either have to raise your hand or ask a question. Uh, let me just uh, bring up my intro slides one second. Yeah, and I'll quickly go through here. Okay, so the 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 key reason why we're is if you the ability to talk to each other. Now, in order to talk to each other, you know, and then you need um, a video camera. But you can see that there's icons of different people. And so what I'd like you to do to try out Shindig 
is click on the icon of another person and introduce yourself. Uh, tell them where you're from, listen to where they're from, and then uh, talk to each other about what you want to learn tonight. So I'm going to give you, it says three minutes, I'm going to give you, I, I know you're, you're a special group, uh, so I'm going to give you two minutes to do that. So over the next two minutes, I'd like you to click on somebody else's icon, uh, introduce yourself, and talk to them about, in about a minute and a half. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so today's uh, today's Monday night. I just I want to say also that we are having another EdChat interactive on Thursday night on September 24th. Uh, for those of you who are interested in problem-based learning, we're going to have Kathleen Fritz talk about a key aspect of problem-based learning, which is driving questions. These are the questions that motivate students and channel their efforts into constructive areas. So uh, you probably you may not want to miss her. Uh, you can go to EdChat Interactive and register. Um, but tonight we're having Robert Kravitz, who's a superintendent, a former principal, former teacher, former entrepreneur, entrepreneur, and who's an author who wrote a really interesting book. That's how I got introduced to Robert is I as I read his book, An Entrepreneur's uh, Success for a, a blue written story, which is a, a guide uh, for success in education based on a combination of education. I'm going to stop the slides. I'm going to bring it up right now. Well, there you are. You're on Thank stage. You. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me, Robert? Absolutely. Very well. So, um, so you were ju you just uh, newly minted at um, you know as as a superintendent at Angle. How did that come about? How did you become superintendent there? Well, I, I went through a process. Uh, it's a much larger district than where I'm at. It has about three thousand five hundred students, a million dollar budget. It has seven schools, four hundred and eighty employees. Went through a whole inter interviewing process. They started with thirty three candidates, and I was wow. the final candidate. Wow. And did you you started there this week or you started there last week or? I, I will actually start there October 1st. So I'm right now in a, wow. in a much smaller district um, mm -hmm. that has only two schools, but um, I'm looking forward to starting there. And, that should and, be and fantastic. Some great, things. great things. Okay. So why don't I bring myself down and I'll bring your slides up next to you and uh, you'll just tell me when to advance the slides. Okay, great. So the first slide that you're going to look at is a little introduction about me and, and my name, as uh, Mitch mentioned, is Robert Kravitz. I'm the superintendent of schools currently in Englewood Cliff, New Jersey, and, and I will be moving to Englewood, New Jersey. A little bit again about me. I started my educational career starting in a charter school in a low-income area and have worked my way up to high school education, middle school education, leadership uh, roles, and now as a superintendent of schools. Previous to education, I was in the business world. I have an MBA, and I was in a food distribution company that I started right out of college, university, and grew the business to over a million dollars in sales. And at some point in my life, a uh, family decision was made to go into education and, and share a lot of great things. So I've come up with some strategies that I wanted to share tonight about parent engagement, which really are transferable to business the same way, of how we talk to people. And, and how we um, get them involved. So the first slide, I ask you this question. You see things, I'd like to know what you see on those slides. And if you can chat me and tell me what you're seeing, that'd be great, okay? So, uh, you see shapes. I don't know, Mitch, if you're getting my, my conversation. So for those of you who saw the slides, we saw three di four different I items on a, on a page. And I always ask this question, well, what do you see? So if you go to the next slide, you put the slides together, and you get a house. So you, pick the, you, you put those pieces together, and you get a house. And it's how we look at things. Sometimes people look at things differently, and we have heard this expression for many, many years. You know, it, it's, I see the, the glass is half full, you see the glass is half empty. But now we're talking about selling, or now we're talking about education. And throughout this demonstration or this, this uh, ed chat, 
I'm going to use these words that will go from business to education. But we see this, this house. Next, next slide, please. See, we see things differently. Even this poor little dog. Now let's shift. So the, yeah, the next slide, the next slide is actually a pic yeah. <laughs> the, the next slide is actually a picture of a um a, a dog. Right. Little dog with glasses because he sees things differently. Or maybe it's yeah, I don't know. But again, we're looking at different things. Next slide. So what are our fears? Now I don't mean to be, you know, prying into personal life and I'm married, so I have other fears. But what is the, per the worst thing that parents can say when we try to communicate to parents? And if you could take a minute and think about that. What are our fears? What is the worst thing that people, parents can say? Now, next slide. So, so I guess, so, so, so right now I'm going to bring uh, Robert down, and uh, what was we'd, we'd like to encourage you all to. I see a number of you are talking already. Uh, what the the goal here is for you all to talk to each other about about the question that that he posed. What is the worst thing that parents can say can say to you? So what what are your worst fears? And I think he's going to join in the conversation along with. Okay, so I think I'm going to bring Robert up here again, and let's see. So, Robert, were you able to uh, talk to anybody about what what fears were? No, I couldn't join in any of the conversation. Okay, so so maybe um, we can we can have the uh, conversation for for a moment ourselves. I mean, what are some of the things in the past that you've heard people say about fears? You know, they're they're afraid of being insulted, um, ridiculed. These are some of the words they use, um, ashamed, uh, just insecure, not comfortable. And these are words that, that we create ourselves and that mm -hmm. we end up uh, not being able to understand where it's coming from. And I think that's where, where people, those words that are, are really scary to people. Just the idea of sitting in front of someone, not knowing which direction they're going to go, what questions they're going to ask. That can be mm -hmm. scary as well because we like to control things, um, and and you know the basic ways of selling ideas is to not be intimidating and to be to be understanding of people. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be interested to see what people have any of the people have said. So we we are now breakout. Um, the only thing is we wanted to hear what people thought about the communication, what comes to mind. But the next slide has the little picture of someone screaming. And, and that's something that, you know, our biggest fear is what's going to happen. Someone's going to come into our office. Someone's going to come into that classroom and they're going to go screaming at you. And we don't know how to react. So the next slide. I, I have borrowed this moniker from Dale Carnegie. And this is a Q-tip, the same kind of Q-tip that we in our ears with. We've, we've changed it around a little bit. And I give these Q-tips out every first day of school for every teacher. Please turn the slide. And I give them this thing that says, remember the Q-tips. Quit taking it personally stupid. It is not about you. They are not angry with you. They are angry with a, a something happening with, with their child or with the education. And we always... We miss that because we get insulted. As I mentioned before, the fears that we have of screaming at us and saying, you stink, my child isn't learning. Well, let's take a step back and let's listen to what they have to say. So let's not take it personally. Let's really try to listen to the words they're using. Okay. Next slide. The, the thing that goes best with this idea is 
how do we communicate? And sometimes when we communicate, we end up doing it via email. And as we all know, when we have a via email, sometimes they use words that sometimes can be insulting to people. So maybe we don't want to use those words. Sometimes the phone call is the best. But sometimes it's a personal touch. We need to be able to see their facial reaction to how we're saying things. So let's go to the next group, which is breakout group two. And I'd like to, and this, this is where it might be difficult because of, I'm having, I guess, technology problems. Let's discuss some scenarios. What scenarios have you encountered in your career in education? Or what scenarios can you think of that might be difficult? And let's talk them through. So Mitch, if you can be that relay person, or if anyone wants to IM me those scenarios, that'd be great. Okay, so I brought uh, Robert down. So, um... So I guess at this time is, a, is another time to click on another person's icon. I see a few of you are doing that already, so that's great. And uh, let's talk with some scenarios where, um, where you've talked to parents in the past or you've thought about talking to parents in the past and, uh, and, and how those turned out or how they might, have, or how they might turn out. And, uh, and then uh, in the IM area, why don't you put some of the ideas that you've come up with in your conversations so that Robert and I can uh, talk about them a little bit later. Okay, so um, so Robert, you and I had a chance to talk a little bit, on, and I see almost everybody in the group is, is talking together, which is great. Uh, we were going to talk about some of the different types of situations that, uh, that occur that might, might lend themselves to a parent teacher talking or a parent school talking. Uh, you had a couple in mind, uh, or maybe some of them came through the IM. What are some of the ones that, that, that uh, you see? Well, somebody just wrote that um, negative experience parents has had let loose at an IEP meeting. Sure. And the question would be before, and, and the other question that I, I received through the IM was about special needs parents, and they shut down, they frustrated. So I, I think the key with special needs parents is that communication that's that's happening beforehand before those meetings the expectation we all know that that you know it's a big issue um stand that parents get frustrated so if they're frustrated and they need a place to vent then we become that venting session uh it's almost sad that that it happens that way and that's what schools have become but we become that venting session where they want to scream and yell and say my child is is on the spectrum and what are you going to do for him So just you know, you know, we can only offer up those our, our, I'm thinking our, that our best, our best belief to help them. But I, I, I think it steps back. Oh, you know, so I, I was, that I was, I was is, thinking is about that. The, the parent is special needs and comes in and starts uh, talking to the teacher about it. I, I, I'm wondering if sometimes that's a result of uh, maybe the leadership of the school not supporting the teacher. Are there things that the school leadership or the district leadership can do that could help the teacher in situations like that? I think actually, absolutely, and we'll talk about that later in my presentation about my triangle theory, but I, I think also that, um, you know, that there has to be that communication and that expectation of what is what do the parents want? And sometimes we lose track of that. And if you could turn to the next page, next slide, Mitch. It says okay, now so what? I have to come down to turn to the next okay. slide. So um, I'll bring myself I down. Answer that. Okay. Okay. All right. It's it's setting the goals, you know. And when we sit with special needs kids and sit in special needs parents, we set those goals as what are what are the expectations? What do they want for their children? Now sometimes they can't answer that, so we have to lead them to say, okay, let's be let's be fair, let's be clear. And it says clear objectives, right? It's a lesson plan. So when we're sitting at that meeting, or actually be, before that IEP meeting, and before that parent meeting, all of these questions should have been answered, should have been put in place. I know that parents are not realistic. I'm a parent. We're all parents, right? But at the same time, we have to communicate to them. And by doing it, um, by doing it, that I, I think we, we, we create that bond, that personal bond. 
you know, there's a balance between being an administrator and being a, a teacher and, and being a parent and the three of them getting together and solving the problem. I have found that many special needs parents, they just want to listen to themselves vent, as I mentioned before, and I think we, we missed the boat on that. A lot of times I have sat on, sat in and continue to sit in on meetings with parents um, where they just want to voice their concern. And I know they're unrealistic. I know it. But we are we are the sounding board for them. And that's that's going to happen. When next slide, if you can, we, we articulate our goals to everybody in that room. We, we have parents, students administrators, um, and, and even our colleagues. Sometimes we're not even realistic with our goals. And again, parents are not, but we have to be. The other slide, I, the next one is the triangle theory slide. So as Mitch mentioned, I think a, a good administrator gets involved and supports that teacher and has those side conversations with that parent to say, hey, this is where we're going to go. This is what has to get done. And, and should be supporting that teacher and should be supporting that parent. So the three of them, the three of them together create this triangle where all of us are working together to help a child. Many times I have found in my educational career that we are not working together. We are not. And, and we are pushing at different amounts of pressure. And if we push together for that pressure, children will succeed. They always do. Next slide is transparency. You know, parents are coming in, people are coming in. Um, move one more past the triangle slide. It's transparency is the key. I think people come in with an amount, with a belief that we're not telling them the truth. And that's that personal touch that I mentioned before. Listen to the parents. Hear what they're saying. Offer them solutions. Uh, become the person that they want to be able to trust. And that will help us. The more we let them know, the more they are empowered. The more we, we let them know, the more they're responsible. The more they let them know, the more they can help us. Because many times, we want to put it back to them. So in our district, where I am right now, we have had issues with attendance. So how did we solve it? Through technology, where we have children who slide in, uh, slide a card when they're late. And when they slide that card, their little ID card, an email goes right back to a parent and says, your child was late today. So we're pushing it back to that parent, saying, your, your child was late. We're telling you your child was late. And now we're documenting that child was late. So it's your responsibility to help us and get here on time. It's a constant push back and forth between a parent, school, which includes the teacher and the administrator, work together for that child's success. So I have always found that the more we let them know, the more eventually we don't have to. It works. It's, it has worked for me. The next slide, please. So actually, the, the slide I'd like to be on where it talks about the scores. So in 2008, I took over a school that was a failing school by the US Department of Education. We had 11% special education population in that school. 6% of the, of the sixth grader, uh, 75%, Let's start again. 66% of the students in sixth grade were passing the NJCSEs tests we were using to measure achievement. 75% in fifth grade. A year later, we went to 90% and 88%. And then in 2010, we went to a National Blue Ribbon School. Through communication, through talking about things, through being able to have that triangle come together so that all the kids, all of the parents, all the teachers, all the administrators, we're on the same page as what is expected from a child, what is ex expected for success. And I think that's where educators lose it. Because we need to be open and we need to communicate and feel uh, not that we're threatening a parent, not taking anything personally, just being able to say, listen, here I am. I'm here to help you. What can I do? And after we're done listening to them vent, listen to the five words that are the important facts of that venting session. Turn it around and say, I heard you. Now, here's a solution to the problem. And once you have that solution and they agree, 
that it's now you've heard them, you've listened to their complaint, and you're giving them back saying, okay, I have now agreed with you, here's how we're going to fix the problem. My experience has been a turnaround story. Are there any questions? I have a question. It, um, in in one case, you have a parent who's uh, maybe overprotective of their child, and and you know you, you really uh, er, earlier with the person, who, the parent who may be talking about and their their child's IE plan. In many cases, the, the the parents, for whatever reason, don't have the energy or the inclination. To get involved with their child's education, and and those kids are really uh, end up being behind the eight ball. How do you involve the parents who, for maybe they're holding down two jobs, whatever they're a single parent or whatever, who don't seem to have time or the inclination to get involved with the with the child's education? So I think uh, want to get involved. I think they're scared to get involved. I don't think we make it easy for parents to get involved. We don't contact parents. You know, people are I aming about transparency. I think that's what. Look, if you, if you were going to a store, and you didn't trust someone, you wouldn't go back to that store. If we're not creating that level of trust to say, what can I do? Making the phone calls at night, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly responding to a parent. I always laugh at my colleagues. Um, my my little mantra is, I get back to parents within two hours, and people ask me mm -hmm. why. And I say, I'm a parent, and I want the answer right away because our, our society is we want quick answers. So if we're not doing that, we're not helping that parent. I think parents want to get involved. I think we shut them out. I think we shut them out. The same way that when we look at boards of education meetings that represent a significant amount of dollars, how many people actually attend? How many people actually know? Because we don't make it easy for them to speak. We don't make it easy for them to ask questions. So you create these, these ways for them to ask the questions. In our district that I'm currently at, I created a, an Ask the Board email. So you don't have to tell me who you are. You just email your questions. And if you want a response in public, I don't, I don't say your name. I just read off the responses. Somebody asked the question about, why aren't we fixing the athletic field? Here's your answer. So more people started to come knowing they were asking questions without actually asking the questions in public. Have you found that it's possible through social media to, uh, to involve parents? Or is it really through uh, e emails or, think, or letters going home with the kids or, or, or mail? I guess the question is, how do you reach out to parents? You have to reach out through phone calls. Fine. Depending on again the the uh, demographics, sometimes it's just standing out front of a building, saying hello. Sometimes it's it's standing outside at the end of school, walking over to parents and saying, you know, I noticed your child wasn't doing well today in math class. Can you help me? And it's the famous thing of the guilt, right? If we give them the guilt in front of them, they don't know what to say. So we create this this position they're in. I I, I work now in an affluent district. So all of the cars are locked up every morning. Stand outside and everyone knows my little handshake, a little wave. Come on over. I need to talk. So when I worked outside in an inner city school, the kids, I would walk out with them and talk to them. I would make those phone calls when I knew the parents were going to be home. You have to do that extra effort. That's where we, we as educators need to step it up and say, okay, I need to be part of this. Mm-hmm. And does that work? You know, I can see it really working in elementary school, where, um, whereas as a teacher, I have 25, 30, 35 kids in one class, and there's only 35 parents that I have to reach out to or sets of parents. Um, but in high school, as a teacher class, that's 150 parents. As a teacher in high school, is it too late? Are the thing? What, no, not what, at all. I did it as a, as a high school teacher. Same thing, and as a high school vice principal with 1,400 kids, right? As a vice principal, I'm making myself known at every event. So I'm sitting at a football game, a basketball game, 
which child is yours? Oh, really? Do you know that he's in the algebra class? Well, you know he's in geometry, or you know he did this, or she did that. You need to get them involved. And when I, as a teacher in a, in a high school, it's, then it becomes the email. And there are a lot of programs that people are using now for student information systems that allow you to push the information back out to parents. This is your attendance record of your child. This is what your child's doing today. That quick email, that quick phone call, it still has to get done, even though with 100 kids. That's our job. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that so makes have, our have job. more questions easier. come through? Mm -hmm. Some high school students are more of a parent than a parent themselves. Agreed. And the conversation has to start from there to that child. What are we going to do to fix it? What are we going to do to help? I think more schools don't realize that the role of an educator has become a guidance counselor or a school counselor or a psychologist. You know, there's a boundary that we have to have, but we have to take into account what kids need. Well, isn't it hard to do that and also with all the pressure as an educator to, uh, to pass the test? or to have my students pass the test? So when we, you know, when we, when I achieved the blue ribbon school, mm. we didn't teach to a test, we taught to learn. And I think that that's where people lose it. I was just on the phone with a parent who was concerned that her, her child wasn't into the um, gifted and talented program. And again, mm. how do you communicate? So after listening to her vent for about 10 minutes, why her child should be in the gifted program, I explained to her that not about the gifted program, it's about learning. And she said, but the gifted program, all the kids will get A's. And I, once you heard that, that was my hook, as I mentioned before, to say, so is it better to have an A or is it better to learn? And she just stopped. And she said, but I, I don't know the difference. And I said, well, the difference is learning is what schools do. That's what we need to do. Um, Rick is writing they have to stay home and babysit the younger kids while they party. Yeah, uh, we have that and it's a shame. Oh, with the parent? Nothing. And then she, how did she, she react did, after she that? Did right after that conversation because huh. she, could she deny that she was not into learning? Or could, what was more important, learning? And she just stopped in your tracks. There have been multiple huh. board meetings, board of education meetings, where I've tried to bring it back and I usually end with this type of question. So can we get back to children or kids learning and not about anything else? And that's where people sometimes have to refocus. And, mm -hmm. and when Rick writes about the kids babysitting younger kids, you know, and that's the part I think where we as educators and the educational system and even our social system is looking at this, they don't know the responsibilities. So before we talk about so many tests, and as you say, teaching to the test, we have to really understand where kids are coming from. You know, mm -hmm. we've, I've taken children the day of a state test and they're required to take that test and their, their father might have walked out on their mother. And the way we look at state tests is they take that test. That's what's wrong right. with this. And mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't include that in it, but it's happening more and more in our system, in our world of education, that kids are having problems. And we need to be able to help them and say, okay, it's not about taking a test today. It's, it's about moving on. Uh, another comment, uh, parents with students in high school are very concerned with grade They can get in the college of their choice for the affluent. I agree. I, I, have, I have seen parents come to me and told me exactly where their child is going in kindergarten. We actually had a child who did not get an A in his second sem uh, semester, and he had belt, mark, uh, belt buckle marks on the back of his back because dad said he had to go to Yale and, and took him on a tour of Yale. And if he didn't get straight A's, he wasn't going to Yale. And that's where we as educators, A, call our protective services, but B, have to be realistic to parents and say, um, you know what, what, what's more important again? Want your kids to be. Because I love this idea that going to a great school means success. Because I have yet to see anyone define success. So again, those are those questions you ask back to a parent. What is success? And they'll say it's money. And then, of course, you know that that becomes very awkward for a parent to respond to after you say to them, so it's about money? Money is the most important thing in life? And they usually can't answer. Mm -hmm. um, so I've sat with a Harvard coach. I don't know if you know, there are Harvard coaches out there. Kids help kids get into Harvard. And I had a parent come and explain to me that if, my, if their child 
when I was a vice principal of a high school, I didn't get into an AP psychology class, they weren't going to Harvard. So again, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I asked mom to explain that to me. And she couldn't, and then we went into the success. And by the way, the child didn't go to Harvard, so all that money spent was wasted. No, it's in, it's. It, I'm sure you look at this is off topic a little bit, but you look at the data about you know about success rates versus the school that that you go to, and there's there really is a very low correlation between the specific school you go to, and either your happiness in life or even if if you were to put money over many of the other metrics, how much money you going to earn in your life, the school you go to has relatively little impact on, um, you know, on, on success in life. Okay, so yeah, we got a little bit, we got a little bit off topic. Um, so we were, I think we were talking about the uh, correlation between the school that, that you go to. But, you know, it just, it seems very often that parents get really, and I've, and I've done this with, with my kids, parents get overly focused on a, on a relatively short-term instrument about their kids instead of looking at the longer term. And you seem to be uh, very skilled at getting them to understand the bigger picture uh, through... I think as educators, we have to do and explain. I, I am a father of three children, and anybody who's a parent knows which ones have got it and which ones have don't. And, and are, where they fit into the scheme of things. And I think mm -hmm. that's where people, you have people who continually say, this, um, my child needs to go to Harvard. Well, that's great, but let's be realistic here. And maybe not Harvard isn't the right school as we talked about. I think that's where parents miss the boat on a regular basis, trying to, to place their child and not be realistic. It's the same parent who pushes that child to sports and says, my child is gonna play major league baseball. Great, but let's be realistic. Your child is very good going to play major league baseball and and if we could get back into that real that realism if we could get back into what people to help children i think that will make it work and it, it really comes down to and and for me it has always come down to building a triangle and and getting all of the people on the same page to say what are we going to do together because there has to be a want factor there has to be a want factor and if the parent doesn't want it Find a way to make them want it. What's that selling point? What's going to make them, as when they're coming from business, what's the hook? And if we educators, we talk about a do now, well, what's the hook that the parent want to step up and say, I'm going to help my kid? And sometimes, and I said it before, it's guilt. Be here at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'll be here the same way. And if they're not here, you call them. I was here. I paid a teacher to be here. Where are you? And sometimes mm -hmm. they just don't, they run out of excuses. And it's the persistence. No, that's, that, that, that's interesting. So what are your, what are your goals at your new So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going into a now a very different uh, district. I am right now, as I mentioned, I'm in the 25th richest zip code in the United States. And I am going into a, a very diverse socioeconomic district. And, and I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I want to answer your question. So now when I was appointed to that position, um, many people got up in the audience. And mm -hmm. the first thing they said is, we are at the bottom. We just want to go to the halfway mark of the rankings in our state. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that was very telling for me because mm -hmm. that meant they just were good with mediocrity. <laughs> now, I don't want mediocrity, but that's right. where they wanted to be. But that meant that there was a desire. Mm -hmm to go up and that's what you need it seems to me that the a lack of hope is something that is so it's almost criminal and and i don't know to what extent it's been society or schools or what it is but it seems that in so many members of our society and so many kids we've removed the hope so mediocrity in itself seems something like wow you know uh, a, a goal um, well, C, no, no one wants to get a C, but C is average. Right. And that's where we have to start to look at these things. Yep. Well, I, was, I, I joke around with certain people who, who complain about things, and they say, you know, I don't really want to live in a country where half people are below average. 
Right. And they said, oh, <laughs> well, yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah, they, they, <laughs> there you go. I, I, I'm 100% for that. And it's like, so, and, and, and then, you know, somebody gets it and, and they'll laugh, you know. Uh, yeah. And Mitch, you know, uh, you'll never be in a country where more than half of the people are above average. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, so it's interesting. So you start October 1st. What are your goals for your new school? Well, you just first, for first, thing you're doing any, first thing is just listen and listen to the people. What do they want? What, what do the customers want? What is it going to take to get there? And, and how are we going to do it to get there? And that's what I have every time uh, in every district. And I have just built success upon success upon success in every school district. And then, of course, I got to plug the book. And that's where the book comes in. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Story and Entrepreneur's Success in Education. Well, that's, yep. That's, and, that's my thing. That's what we do. We look for success and right. in, in, in turning around schools. So, um, so uh, Carol has an interesting question here. So, what is the ratio of parent involvement from your, what percentage of uh, parents do you expect to be involvement, to be involved in, in schools? And then, What's the, what, are you, what are you expecting for your, um, for your new district? So, you know, it's how you sell it again. So when I, when, what I get as a percentage of my student, school population at parent-teacher organization meetings or PTA meetings is it runs usually from 25 to 35%. Um, but again, what I try to do is, is create three different avenues to hear it. I'll create a coffee hour in the morning, a coffee hour at night. I'll present myself at PTA meeting so that there's always this ability to ask the question. You know the famous open door policy? Well, that's what I do. So after three events during a month with the same theme, those questions are answered. Uh, Helen asks the question, the reality is, this, is the affluent always have better teachers or, or resources versus the underprivileged? Technology will, will, will off, be offered at home, will be offered, I hope. Um, I started in an inner city school where we had... I would say 90, 95% were free and reduced lunch. I was a good teacher. <laughs> I was teaching business. I had an MBA. Uh, I brought affluent kids, excuse me, inner city children to a stock market game for the state of New Jersey. And they took fourth place. It's how we, how we get them involved. Um, and that's what sometimes we miss, that we're not, we need to get all of those kids involved. And the district that you're going to, I mean, you're, you just finished or you are fin finishing as a superintendent of a relatively affluent district, I think, but the district right. that you're going to is far from affluent, correct? Correct. It's, um, it's about 60% free and reduced lunch. It's a very interesting, diverse, as I said, town that has four different quadrants and each quadrant has a different population base of which two of the four don't send their children to the schools. They opt for private schools and it ranging from 15,000 thousand dollars per year so our goal again is to take those schools and and just um, highlight the good find out how to get the parents involved find out what they want to hear and and get them on board with the great program and that's what we can do and I know we can do it because I've done it before yep okay well we'll have to follow up in uh, this time next year and and okay and see how you're doing so we're, we're, we're at the top of the hour and I don't want to keep people extra you know, extra time, and I want to apologize to people for the technical problems we've had, and apologize to you for any parting words that you'd like to impart to people. Well, uh, all I all I can say is just don't be afraid. Communicate the Q-tips. Always remember the Q-tips, and. Take a look at my book and go to my website, www.robertkravitz.net. You can read all about me, but Q-tips, it's just a parent. We're all parents. We want to be able to and just you listen quit to it. Quit taking it personally. It. Yep, quit taking it personally. Okay. All right, so if you <laughs> want to yell, yell at me, I won't take it personally. <laughs> um, no, I don't think I yell, I yell much either. But, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for, um, you know, uh, being so flexible. Change the format here tonight, uh, and uh, I'll be on the phone tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to people for Shindig. For those of you who are here, I hope uh, you attend future events and you you see how interactive we normally are. Um, and uh, Robert, I'll you know I'll, I'll keep keep in touch, and and I wish you 
incredible success at that and, and everything you've done so uh, far. Somebody asked me a question. They said, can you give a copy of the, do I give a copy of the books to the parents? Sure. When they come in, I give a copy. I try to sell it to support the family. But at the same time, it's always important to, to, to work with that customer and try to get them on, on board with you. That makes the difference. And that's it. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank uh, Robert, thank you. And, um, right. you know, hopefully see you all at other events. Bye.